Hi, I'm Don Berwick, a pediatrician and president emeritus and senior fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I also have the privilege to have been the chair of the Academy's Committee on a National Trauma Care System, and I'd like to say a few words of introduction to this important report. War is to be avoided, but if it comes, and history says it will, morality and pragmatism converge on an imperative to protect those sent into harm's way. Those who serve in the military need and deserve a promise that should they sustain a traumatic injury, the best known care will come to their assistance to offer them the best chance possible for survival and recovery, and further, that over time, learning and innovation will steadily increase that chance. Under the terms of the Geneva Convention, that same obligation extends to the care of civilian noncombatants who themselves are swept into conflict and injury. Trauma, of course, is by no means confined to military conflict. In the United States, traumatic injury is a major threat to the health of the public, causing in the aggregate the loss of more years of life than any other source of illness or disability. For every war-related casualty, there are hundreds of trauma patients in civilian life. The good news is that both the military and civilian sectors have made impressive, arguably remarkable progress in the care of trauma over the past few decades with concomitant gains and outcomes. For example, much has been learned and done about timely stabilization and, and rapid transfer to definitive care about approaches to resuscitation and management of hemorrhage, about training and equipage of first responders, and protocols and guidelines for best practices. In military health care, major declines in trauma death rates among injured warriors testify to these advances. The best civilian emergency care systems show similar gains. This progress has not occurred by chance. Uh, much of the progress in military trauma care is associated with learning processes lessons gained, captured, and built upon pragmatically, just as is not contemplated in the description of a learning health system in the Institute of Medicine report on best care at lower cost. This committee was convened to study and evaluate progress toward better trauma care and outcomes, especially in the military sector, to understand how that progress relates to elements of a learning health system, to recommend how learning and improvement could be even better, and to understand how both trauma care and learning can best be translated between the military and civilian uh, trauma care systems. As this report documents, the committee's efforts revealed both good news and bad. On the one hand, superb trauma care characterized by important innovations with documented better outcomes but on the other hand, serious limitations in the thoroughness of the diffusion of those gains over time and space, both within the military and between the military and civilian sectors. Even as the successes have saved many lives, the gaps have cost many lives. An especially significant challenge is to maintain readiness for expert trauma care in the military in the periods between wars. The committee found meeting this need to be one of the several reasons to view the military and civilian trauma care systems as in many ways the same system, not two systems, or at least much more closely interconnected than has been the case to date. As the IOM's learning health system concept emphasizes, uh, progress towards such a system depends strongly on leadership, and this report contains a number of key recommendations for clearer and more consolidated leadership on a national scale to achieve better trauma care. The committee recommends that the United States adopt an overall aim for trauma care of zero preventable deaths after injury. And it sets forth elements of system redesign that would be needed to achieve that aim. This committee had the great privilege of extensive cooperation and advice from highly experienced military and civilian trauma care experts many from the front lines of care. Uh, committee members included such experienced caregivers as well. For those members, uh, such as me, whose careers have not included providing tra direct trauma care 
or serving in the military, this exploration has been a truly humbling experience. The committee read about and saw graphic images of some of the horrific forms of injury that today's military combatants incur and became more fully aware of the grave risks that this nation asks its soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines to face. We heard compelling cases of heroic rescue in which advanced knowledge, teamwork, and modern technology were used to save lives that only a few years ago would surely have been lost. And we heard testimony from clinicians and care system managers whose courage, initiative, imagination, and unwillingness to concede led directly to crucial innovations, sometimes in the face of significant barriers of habit and bureaucracy. These are heroes, both the injured and those who simply will not quit when trying to help them. This report documents a number of important and badly needed changes in trauma care, beginning with leadership toward a common, bold, shared aim. Accomplishing these changes will not be easy. Indeed, this committee is by no means the first group to suggest a number of these changes. Yet too many of the prior calls for consolidated leadership, for strong system designs, and for clear lines of responsibility have not been heeded. It is our hope that in honor of the military and civilian trauma patients whose lives and function can be saved in the future, this time will be different. As one committee member put it, when it comes to trauma care, where you live ought not to determine if you live. It's time for a national goal owned by the nation's leaders, zero preventable deaths after injury. Thanks.